You're listening to Art Affairs, episode 27. Today I'll be talking to Michael Reeder. So my name's Michael Faith, and this is Art Affairs. And it just so happens that this is a pretty special episode. It's been a whole year since this show first debuted, and it's been such a pleasure to work on. I'm so grateful for all the wonderful guests who've come on and chatted with me along the way, and to you for all the amazing support. I really hope this has been something worth listening to, and that you've enjoyed tuning in. As always, you can find out more about the show on my website, artaffairspodcast.com, and you can subscribe on all the major podcast platforms. You can also connect with the show on Instagram and Facebook at Art Affairs Podcast. All right, so today's guest is artist Michael Reeder. Michael is most well-known for the figure-based work that he creates with all sorts of different mediums, from canvas, many times multi-layered wood panels, sometimes even concrete. We talk about his use of so many different mediums on the show, as well as his lifelong love of graffiti culture, his latest solo show at Hashimoto Contemporary, and a whole lot more. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Michael Reeder. Michael, welcome to the show, man. It's really good to have you on. Hey, thanks so much for having me, man. All right, cool. And I think as it as it turns out, this is going to end up being the one year anniversary show. So that's actually kind of cool. Yeah, that is cool. Don't you know? Thanks for the added pressure. But uh, <laughs> <No>. you know. <laughs> All right, so let's let's dive into your background a bit. Um, you know, you were born and grew up in the Dallas area, which uh, is actually something you and I have a common have in common. Um, I was actually uh, you know grew up in the northern suburbs of Dallas and spent most of my life there. Uh, what part of Dallas did you spend most of your time in? Uh, I grew up in uh, Oak Cliff, so just just south of the Trinity River, a great area. I'd I'd actually really like to move back there myself. Um, you know, now this late in life, <laughs> it's, it's a nice little little uh, neighborhood. I I really enjoy it. Something you know special about it. Okay, so that's like south of the city, right? Right. Okay. Right. It's south of downtown. Like you know, the Trinity River kind of cuts right at the base of of downtown and. Uh, Oak Cliff is literally just on the other side of that that uh that river bridge. What kind of work did your parents do? Anything art related? No, <laughs> uh, no, not at all. Um, see, they were you know just general working class. You know, uh, my my dad uh, is a, a warehouse worker. Um, you know, worked on the dock, loading and unloading trucks, driving you know trucks around, forklifts around. Um, my mom was a receptionist for quite some time. Um, moved around to, uh, eventually like, uh, you know, doing, uh, accountant work and, uh, you know, accounts payable and all that type of stuff. Um, so, you know, definitely no real creative, uh, output coming from them, um, in terms of visual art, but, I would have to give credit to both of them um, in in the sense of being supportive with my interest in it as an individual. Um, They were always really into it and excited about what I was doing as a little kid, like drawing, you know, uh, you know, comic books or whatever I was doing at the time. But my mom was really, you know, into crafts like, you know, holiday type crafts. Um, So, you know, that was kind of cool and definitely was uh, a fun uh, way of, picking up certain little things of, of making stuff, you know, and different, uh, cool things that she would present to me. And, and my dad's, uh, album collection, his, uh, vinyl music album collection was, you know, of course riddled with, you know, cover art and stuff. And that was a massive influence for me, man. So, so was that, that's sort of what really sparked your interest early on, or was there some other aspect of your childhood that got you curious about creating art? Man, it, it's, Obviously, at the time, I, I didn't know, which, you know, but, you know, looking back on everything, um, the album art was huge for me. Um, and it, it's it, again, it's tricky to look back and try and see what, what if there was like this one massive major thing. But 
really I just enjoyed the process of, of sitting down with my own time at the coffee table and and drawing or trying to learn how to, you know, uh, render a photograph or a, a picture of a car or, you know, whatever, you know, it, it's like that process just really was engaging for me. And I, and just, I, I enjoyed it all the time. I would rather do that than go outside and play with kids. And my mom was really concerned about it at one point. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the, the album art with, with the graphic nature of all that stuff. And, you know, it's, you know, the, the graphic art nature of it was, was huge. And, and, you know, comic books and all the general, you know, little kid stuff, um, was, was, a, a major influence, um, which I think you can see in my work now, but you know, that's the early, early years. But as I, you know, continue to grow up, um, I think other, you know, teachers and whatnot started to, to see, uh, potential in, in what I was doing. And, uh, I had a, uh, an instructor in the first grade, uh, her husband was a, a fine artist, a, an oil painter, like a traditional oil painter. And, uh, you know, he, he saw potential and, 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 you know, you know, uh, hit up my parents, you know, confronted them and was like, Hey, you know, I, I give private lessons to, to, uh, to, you know, kids and anyone who's interested or whatever, you know, and, you know, he had like a, it, actually he was in my, my neighborhood. Um, their house was in, in Oak Cliff and, uh, you know, had like a, a studio or whatever in the, in the garage and, and, uh, you know, so he presented that to my parents, you know, to see if like they were okay with it. And so like, you know, my dad tagged along for the first round and, you know, it was, it was cool, you know, but like, it was a little overwhelming for me at the same time. Like I was really into it. Um, but at the same time, like, I think, you know, I was really, I wasn't, so much about having so much attention on me at the same time. Like it was a little like overwhelming. And, and, and so I, I eventually backed out of it, but it was still a huge uh, learning process and experience for me that I think stuck with me, you know, to be so young and then to be introduced to this process of sitting down with the canvas and picking colors with oil paint and learning how to use linseed oil to mix the paint and, oh, yeah. and, and, and translate an image and stuff at such an early age what I think was massive because I knew that that existed where like most kids my age didn't even, you know, what, where, you know, what, and so they're building Legos. Where are they going to pick yeah. up? <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and then that transitioned over to, you know, PBS watching Bob Ross. And so, you know, I'm, you know, not even in, in out of elementary school yet. And, you know, I'm, my brain's working like that. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of little moments that I think were like these, aha moments of like how how much larger art could be and there was so much more for me to learn and I was so engaging and, and intriguing for me I remember this one one time this I think it was in, in kindergarten a friend of mine his name was Michael as well we got the Michael trio you me him this kid <laughs> <laughs> um and he was a really good like um drawer artist you know, whatever at such a young age, but he was like a grade older or something to me. And we both sat down with this hot wheel in front of us and we started drawing it with like literally like a, a crayon. And this dude like saw it entirely different, differently than me. Like I got, I was drawing it like a little kid normally does flat 2d side, like what you sure. perceive it as this dude was like rendering out the perspectives of like the hood and the roof and all this stuff. Wow. And I was just blown away. I was like, he, he sees this and like, that triggered like the vision that I needed to see for that next little level bump as a little kid teaching myself how to draw and stuff. Like I remember like he let me keep it and I like my dad picked me up and we went to go pick my mom up from work. And I'm like, dad, look at this thing. This guy drew this thing. Like this is, this is a drawing. Like for me, it was so real, you know, because of the perspective aspect that he added into it and it just blew my mind. And so like these, little moments like that. And then the, the couple of, you know, uh, uh, private, uh, uh, oil painting lessons or whatever, you know, those, those things were huge for me. And then I, it led into, you know, uh, you know, art school with, uh, middle school and, and, uh, arts magnet in high school. And so it just, it just, just kept growing and just learning and just like the bag of tricks was massive by the time I was even freaking 15, you know? Yeah, no, it's incredible that, that, they were able to recognize your 
your skills and your talent and make use of that at such a young age because first grade is like what six years old I mean that's like super young and to be able to recognize the talent and cultivate that so early I'm sure that was a huge huge benefit for you yeah they had in that particular class they had um you know it was like you have one teacher for the whole year you know so like we we were in the one classroom for the whole day or whatever and every day there was like a topic and it would get drawn onto the board, like a, an image of it, you know, whatever it would be a whale or whatever. And the instructor, the, the teacher, um, she started to see my potential and she gave that task to me almost like practice, almost like I'd get up in front of the class first thing in the morning, we all walked in and I'm picking up chalk and I'm drawing a wasp or whatever, whatever we were going to be focusing on, one of the topics. And and then her husband noticed the same thing because he would come in and help and assist, you know. And uh, then it led into the, 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 the lessons, the oil painting lessons. And again, I only did it a couple of times, but I think that just seeing that, having that introduced to me was humongous for me. Yeah. And so, so fast forward to high school and you mentioned you, you had an arts focused high school, you went to an arts magnet high school, right? Um, but that was also around the time from what I understand when you really fell in love with graffiti and hip hop culture. Right. Um, so how did that come about? Like what sparked your interest in, in graffiti culture? Man, I mean, you know, the graf- what's great about graffiti is it's just out there in front of everybody, like in, in everyone's face. Like that's probably my favorite part about it, to be honest, is like, it's unapologetic in the sense that it's, it's in your face. And, you know, people are going to be going to work and sitting in traffic and they're going to be forced to see your throw up on a, on a rooftop or whatever, you know. Um, so I think that I started to spot and identify all the graffiti around me and the different levels of it and uh, just started to become like really intrigued and in, like what that was and like what is this unknown world. And, you know, of course, the older you get into high school and stuff, you know, you start to actually meet more individuals that know more, you know, this is pre YouTube, pre internet, you know, like it wasn't like I can jump on the internet and like look up graffiti and how to, you know, hold a spray can and all that stuff, you know, and pull these lines. It was, it was, it was again, back to the whole thing. It was being really intriguing in terms of trying to deconstruct how they, how they did these things, not even just in a cool way, you know, in terms of color and, and style, but it was freaking illegal. So they had to do it fast. So, you know, it, it just caught my attention like early and, and I fell in love with it immediately. And that coupled with, you know, skateboarding culture and just counterculture in general and music and just, you know, stepping, stepping away from, you know, being, you know, around my parents so much because the high, the arts magnet high school was downtown. So like I had to ride the you know public transit uh, train to school. And so like there was like this bit of newfound freedom that was introduced to me and and I, I took that and ran with that. Like, dude, I was doing so much, so much in that one little period of time. Like, you know, my parents would, my mom would drop me off at the train at like 630 in the morning and like, you know, or seven or whatever. And it'd be like, you know, just to make sure that if there was any hitches in, in the, the journey on the train, I could still get to school on time. So like I had to start it a little bit earlier. And then once I figured out that that, that was my time, I was like, I need to get the, the train a little earlier, you know, <laughs> like it's getting a little close there. You know, it's like pushing, like I'm, you know, I got two hours of like just freedom and, you know, I'm riding the train way past my stop to get off, like at school and just like getting off in like, you know, in, in East Dallas somewhere and like, you know, meeting people and, and, and doing graffiti at like, you know, eight o'clock in the morning and climbing rooftops and getting chased by the cops. And, you know, I'm like, you know, 14, 15, 16, you know, it it was wild, like to be that young and and fearless, you know, that's amazing. And then you end up going to school and and just, you know, booking a day at school. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And then there's like, you know, it's a casual day at school and I'm not paying attention. I'm like over there in a black book doing graffiti, like just completely, completely immersed in that world, you know, for, for years. What was your, uh, what was your tag name? It wasn't reader one, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, which isn't bad. You know, I probably should have ran that, but, um, let's see. The very first one was, I think jive. And then I got in trouble. And so I had to bail on that. And then I did, um, let's see, I think it was, it was jive. And then I switched mainly to omen. Um, and like, that's what I ran with. And again, like this is pre like social media and everything. So like, 
you would have a name and you'd be running it for years and then you would come across a, a, a train, a freight train and like there's like this dude, someone else like writing your name like way better than you and you're like, crap, okay, <laughs> what? You know, so like, of course, now I know that there's like, there's been like four or five like very legitimate omens that I would not have wanted to deal with battling or anything, you know, so, uh, you know, it's funny to, to have this type of information, uh, you know, freedom. Uh, so it's, it's weird to look back on like how, how more tight lipped everything was like, even just technique wise, like just fighting to find the, the, the tricks and fighting to find the, the information and knowledge within that world. So it was like this weird thing, you know, like, you know, starting off, you know, you think that you're invincible because you're thinking, you know, or at least I was thinking at the time that it's no, no one's going to know it's you. You're doing it. You're not, you know, nobody's seeing you do this. You're doing it in the, you know, in the, in the middle of the night or, you know, when nobody's looking or whatever, right? It's like the unseen world, except you can be seen and you can get caught. And, and, you know, then, you know, the, the underground graffiti world, definitely has a group of people that know each other and have means of contacting you. And, you know, so it's, it's definitely interesting. I definitely had like one graffiti writer call my house oh, wow. and my dad picked up and was like, you know, hello. And, and dude was like, Hey, is Omen there? <laughs> like, <laughs> like what? And, and like my dad, my dad's just like, yep, yeah, hold on. And then he's just like, he's like, he, he Hey Mike, there's you know somebody asking for Omen, and I'm like, ah, oh, geez, this isn't good. <laughs> you know, it's just like calling my parents' like house landline, like asking for me via my graffiti name. Were you, were you part of any kind of crews at all there in, in Dallas? Yeah, um, I started my own crew called uh, Earth Grain Squad. Um, that name kicked off from the one of the first times that one of my friends and I like painted his room. Uh, his bedroom with like spray paint. So like we, we knew that it was going to get, you know, fogged out with, with spray paint. So, you know, we covered some of his stuff and we went to the local like thrift store and picked up some throwaway clothes and some bandanas and whatnot and some beanies. And one of the beanies was from that bread company called earth grains. <laughs> and so, you know, by the end of it, you know, we were all like buzzed out on the, on the, the fumes. We were like, dude, we're earth grain squad. We're going to run with the EGS, you know? <laughs> So it's like it's stuck, you know, and it's it's a good one, you know. I, I I'm very proud of that, you know. Had a ended up having like a great group of friends and and writers a part of that that crew. So I definitely miss it. Should start it back up. That's amazing. Did you ever? You, know, you mentioned trouble, like getting chased by the police. Did you ever get into any like legit trouble? Oh yeah, that's why I pretty much had to had to hang it up. It was just getting a little too overwhelming and consuming too much of of my not not only like literal like money and and time but like headspace i just couldn't even really focus on what i should have been focusing on and that was you know my learning my my fine art stuff in school and whatnot of course so yeah there was like multiple times like man i mean the the one catalyst time was a buddy of mine and and myself like broke out like Friday afternoon, like three three thirty or something in the afternoon, on like a sound barrier wall, like right off the freeway with like roller paint. <laughs> it's just intense, man. I don't know why we thought we were just invincible like that, but we did, you know. And we almost got away with it. Is that's the the wildest part? Um, you know, we were we were we we were starting a new crew, and so we wanted to put up two big block letters. Um, with the bucket paint, you know, with the roller, like blockbuster style. And there's like a huge wall. It's like maybe like 15 feet tall by like 30 feet wide or something. And I see in the corner of my eye, the cops on the other side of the wall, which was a parking lot, pull up behind the wall. And I just mm-hmm. told my friend, start buffing it white. Because we had just switched over to like outlining the for the letters. So it was a white, white fill and we started blocking in the black outline for the letters and I'm like, start painting it white. And so like he just starts jumping over onto the white. I walk around with the roller in, in my hand, walk up to the cops. They're still sitting in the car. And I'm like, hey, how's it going? You know? And they're like, what are you doing? What are you guys doing? Like, and, and I'm like, oh man, we got in trouble at school, so we're doing community service, like buffing graffiti. <laughs> Cause like there was so much graffiti, like, you know, your general spray paint bombs and whatnot on these big walls, and we just buffed it white. That's amazing. So 
yeah, so like on the fly, <laughs> I came up with that, and, and I was like, yeah, we got in trouble at school. We had some fireworks, and you know, setting off, you know, you know, blackjacks or something, and the black cats in the, in the uh, bathroom or something. I said, and and then the cops were like, oh, okay, and they kind of looked at me funny. But then they pulled off and I came around and we should have just bounced then. Right. But, you know, the ego was just raised. And I was like, dude, like the cops pulled off. We fooled them. So we started going back in on the letters. We finished the letters and we start walking down the train tracks to the car. And like the dude's like uh, next to me, he's like, do you hear that? And I was like, don't turn around, don't turn around and just keep going to the car, keep going to the car. And these cops had got out of the car and started yelling at us. And uh, to, you know, stop or whatever. And we jumped in the car and burned out and hit traffic. And they just hit the lights and cut through. And that was that. Aww. But, uh, you know, that was a good one. There was another one where we were, you know, at, at night, we, we told our parents we were going to go to the the, the Tilt, uh, you know, arcade downtown in the West yeah. End. Yeah. The West End, yeah. And, you know, now it's all like around there. It's just like all built up condos, like all that craziness. But it was like a bunch of empty warehouses and it was like a couple of spots that we, we eyed out and it was just getting dark and we went and pulled, parked the truck in the back, my, my little mini truck in the back and, uh, went around to the front, did some graffiti and we started hearing sirens getting closer and closer. So we just broke out and started running, come around to the, the truck and my, I had set the alarm, you know, my old like Viper alarm, <laughs> shitty alarm to my truck and my buddy opens the door and the alarm starts going off real crazy. And right then, this cop, a woman cop, like comes out with a gun pointed at me, telling me to put my hands up. And I'm like, "Oh shit!" Oh, wow. You know, <laughs> I got I got a hoodie on. It was a zipper kind. You know what I'm saying? With like the the hoodie pouches, with the uh, so it's split. So I got two cans, one on one side and one on the other, and they're just sticking out. And she's telling me to put my hands up. I put my hands up. I know she sees the cans. <laughs> my buddy's in the car. Alarms going off. And, what a mess! And I know it's a freaking mess. And she, she's like, "Is this your car?" You know, you know, whatever. And she's yelling at me, and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." I'm like, "I'm gonna grab my keys and grab the keys and set the and turn the alarm off." And she's like, you know, yelling at my friend to get out. He gets out, cans dump out of the car, and then she asks for my ID. And then she's just like, "What are you guys doing?" We're like, "Well, we're just we parked the car over here, so we didn't have to pay for parking." And and we're like, "Clearly, there's spray cans everywhere," <laughs> you know. <laughs> and she's like. She she's like, you know, she looks at me all weird. She's like, hands me the ID. And then she's just like, all right, you guys need to get home. And I'm like, oh, my God. Wow. Oh wow. My God. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, So, yeah, you got you skated by uh, a few uh, different situations that could have gone really bad. Yeah, there's so many. I mean, even like, you know, more sketchy stuff like, you know, not even involving the cops, but like, you know, things breaking off when you're trying to elements of a, a rooftop or something, you know, like a. You know, rusty ladder and you know something breaks free and then you're hanging crazy yeah i got all kinds of stories so you so you ended, you managed to graduate throughout all of this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then after graduating um you you took some time and went to a school that's you know somewhat local but then ended up not really uh jiving too well with that yeah. and ultimately went to new york and and the school of visual arts so kind of help me with that trajectory a little bit how did you end up going to new york and, and going to sva well, you know, yeah, the the first school was, you know, it just needed to happen that way, you know, with like, you know, money and, and just it was a little overwhelming uh, for myself and my family to even consider some of the cost of some of the, the higher end art institutes. So um, even with, you know, the uh, scholarship help, it was still pretty intense. So, you know, just went to the, the local school in, in Texas and and it, it just wasn't challenging, man. Like, it was, like, literally just a continuation of high school. Like, there was some stuff that was more, you know, there were more things offered at my high school than this college. It was freaking wild. Like, so, yeah, stopped going there. And then I took, like, a year and a half off and delivered pizzas and saved money. And uh, eventually it was like, all right, we got we to gotta get back into school. And, like, I need to do something that's legit for me, something challenging, something that I've been wanting to do. And, of course, you know, New York was something that was, you know, uh, an area that I wanted to check out and see. And and keep in mind, I, you know, I hadn't traveled anywhere, bro. Like whenever I finally went to school in New York, I, you know, put everything into like two decent sized boxes, shipped it out and got on the plane, which was the first plane, plane ride I've ever been on. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was like 2021 20, or something at that time and finally got my butt into 
New York and was just like, yeah, this is the place right here. This is what's up. Like so much great energy. Um, you know, it just, I, I loved it. I still love it. I, I was, you know, seeing the people dancing in the streets yesterday. Like, man, I was like, bro, like love New York. The the vibe there is so wild, but it, it's a, it's a, it's an animal. It's a, it's a certain animal. You got to be down to, to ride, uh, you know, day in, day out, man. It's a, it's a rough one. Do you think you'll ever end up back there? Man, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't have stuff to say. I've, I've lived there multiple times. Uh, so who knows? But, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I really, I doubt it just because of how expensive it is. Uh, you know, I'd like to purchase a house so I can have something that I own. So whenever I'm like old and nobody's buying my art anymore, <laughs> like I have a place to freaking stay, you know? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. While you were while you were living in New York, were you involved in the graffiti scene at all? You know, obviously that was a big part of you know your your high school years. I mean, I did get kind of pulled into it a little bit, um, but again, I started to get you know it, it venture back into what inevitably comes along with that, and that is like the you know the the challenge of the law and the, the illegal aspect of it, obviously. So it just becomes a massive you know uh, uh, a massive distraction. What I'm trying to say, you know, in terms of trying to, you know, focus on school. I borrowed hella money to go to school in New York and, and learn things. And, and, you know, I'm stoked to be there. I shouldn't be like focusing on painting trains or whatever. So, uh, it, 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 I definitely put a halt to it, but, uh, you know, it was tough because it's out there and it's all over the place. And it was everything that I was, I was watching, you know, there's like three VHS videos of graffiti whenever I started doing it, you know, and, and, you know, you used to, you know, watch those things religiously and so then, then there i am i'm in freaking new york where it all started you know it's just like how do you not do it so so when you first started at sva you um your your initial focus was originally illustration um and then you right. ultimately switched to fine art so i guess what was behind your interest in illustration and how did you end up switching to fine art well every you know my my art focus in general has always been like illustration and graphic kind of style, um, you know, with comics and, you know, different, you know, characterized elements and just a, a, a certain graphic quality to my work um, and, and my interest in art and what I enjoyed making. So it always just, you know, especially maybe it was more so like instructors just pushing me and directing me down this illustration path. And so... I just, you know, started and applied as an illustration major there and got in and did one year. And then I just started to realize that, like, what the general, like, layout for the the, the plan in terms of being an illustration major there wasn't what I was, like, really needing or wanting, you know. It's like, I can, you know, keep pushing my own illustration stuff. I can take some courses here and there if I want. But, like, in terms of really learning something and immersing myself in something that like I had no knowledge in and, and, and wanted to learn more about. And like, that was the fine art stuff. So I really wanted to step in and, and broaden my scope of, of, of fine art in general, not just hone in further on illustration. I, I wanted that background and, in, in material and in general, like I, I, you know, we, we talk about like art, you know, but at the same time, like my focus has always been just making stuff. Like I, I've really just enjoyed you know building things and tearing things apart and putting stuff back together and whatever you know little kid style you know just all the way down you know it's just been a major focus for me forever and and so fine art would would offer that of course so you know branched out and you know just started pushing that and then I started you know doing like a a side job doing like some carpentry work you know like like an apprentice almost so really picked up some some woodworking you know tricks uh doing that so you know it just all started to kind of come together and and uh, I'm really thankful that I I went that route I mean when I graduated my thesis work was just kind of like nothing but floundering around trying to figure it out but so was everybody else's you know it's not like we figured out our style that we're going to stick with for the you know the remainder of our careers um so I understood that and I you know I very thankful dude like you know you know, many, many of my instructors left me with some pretty strong uh, one liners that I that I follow till this day, you know, like when I'm in the studio and I'm, you know, thinking about some of the things that they 
suggested, you know. It, it was also a little overwhelming too in the same sense where you got like a bunch of of, of artists because, you know, they're professors or they're instructors, but at the end of the day, they're just an artist like any other artist. So it's just their perspective on what you're doing and their perspective and opinion on art. So after when you graduate, then you're just like flooded with all these different individual artistic perspectives and you need to weed through that mess and figure out what actually pertains to you and what do you want to like discard and like that takes time bro that took years sure i mean it sounds like that i mean you graduated in in 2007 with your bfa right. and it sounds like that that was a rewarding experience to you i mean you, you mentioned earlier how costly it was and you had to borrow a lot of money um do you feel that that was worth the cost and did it help you grow in the way that you you needed yeah, I mean, you know, th this question gets asked quite a, a lot for, you know, a lot of artists, of course, you know, art school, is it worth it? Do you, you need to, you know, do you, do you recommend younger artists follow this path? And it's, I can see it going both ways. And I've heard great arguments on both sides of, of it, of course. Um, but, you know, I decided to try and do it. And, you know, for me, it was it was even it was bigger than just the the, the specific school and, and what I what I learned at the schools um, and with the different instructors. Like it was also like a, a growing experience for me, uh, moving to a different city and uh, experiencing a, a broader sense of culture, breaking outside of my bubble that I was you know in in Texas, which we know is a very serious bubble. You know, it, it's a cool bubble. I like it. I'm not hating it, but it is a fucking bubble. And you need to break outside of that if you want to have any broader sense of the world around us. And I'm very, very, very thankful that I did that. Um, and it came in the in the, the the sense of having to borrow money and go to school in another state, and um, that was massive for me. But um, again, like I was kind of mentioning moments ago, like you know, I I came out of that with some stuff that really helps me in my practice today. Um, you know, so I had some pretty amazing instructors. I had some that weren't that amazing, but I've had a couple that were really, really good and really helped me, uh, you know, become comfortable with my process of what, what I deem is legitimate in my practice and, in art, you know, um, I had Jack Witten as an instructor and I remember this one time he, um, came around, it was senior year. And so, you know, again, floundering, like trying to figure out what I'm painting, you know, whatever. And he was, and I had one painting leaning up against the wall, smaller on the ground. And he was like, that's a good painting. And I'm like, oh, you like that one? You know, because he in general didn't like any of the other stuff I was doing. <laughs> and so I was kind of like, whoa, whoa, you know. And uh, he was like, yeah, it's super weird. And like, that was his response to it. And I was like, I was like, like, that's why you like it? And he was like, yeah. He's like, it makes no sense to me. And he's like, remember... <laughs> He's like, imagination has its own logic. And like, that was huge for me, bro. Like I, I ended up writing about that in, in my senior thesis. Like, you know, that, you know, to so often, even till this day, you know, like I make something, I paint something and people are like, what does it mean? What does that thing right there mean? What, why did you bring this into the image? And it's like, dude, I have no freaking idea. Like I have zero idea, but it's in there and it looks cool. And, and maybe in a, in a couple of years, um, I'll know better why I brought it in there, but at this current point in time, um, you know, it, it, it earned its way in there because in that realm of, in that world, it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. You know, wh why do we need to you know, try to bring it into this, you know, this other sort of, you know, you know, world of, of having to make sense, you know, for other people like, you know, Make it make sense for you. I don't know, dude. Like, I make weird stuff. You know? <laughs> Very cool. Um, and so following graduation, you ended up moving back to Dallas. Um, I guess what brought you back uh, back to Dallas? Was it to stay close to your family? Um, yeah, I mean, like, that. that's definitely always there, you know, um, you know, for sure. Um, and on top of that, the freaking bills were, like, immediate. Like, like part of my loans were already consolidated. So I had forfeited the uh, grace period that comes with uh, student loans. So like that next Monday, I was already looking at a payment. Mm. So I was like, all right, we got to get serious with this world, you know, life in the bigger world sort of situation. And, and uh, I didn't really see New York being doable. Like I probably could have done it. You know, I had, a, I was already set up 
you know, in an apartment with two roommates that I, you know, really, you know, gelled with and, you know, could have made it work. But like, what was I going to do for a workspace? Like, it was like, I was paying like, you know, I don't remember what for like a single bedroom in like an apartment in Brooklyn. And, you know, I didn't have the extra money or a job lined up to, you know, line up a studio space to work and figure that whole thing out. So I was just like, all right, let's get back to Dallas where it's more affordable. Move back in with the, with the parents at like, what, 24 years old or something for like a limited amount of time. But, uh, yeah, I got, I got lucky though, man. Like within a week I'd, I'd landed a a job working at Icon Studios, which is a a large, you know, mural commercial mural company, uh, in Dallas. And again, like that turned, that, that was like one of those things that just, I can't even place a value on that. Like that was massive, bro. Like it was a job. I was getting paid money. I was paid hourly. It was, it was independent work, but at the same time, like, um, uh, it's just, it was, it was invaluable, dude. Like, like it was like, it ended up being like an apprenticeship and, and took the place of an MFA program for me for real. Like it's, I didn't even like consider going to school for my master's and anything. I was like, man, I'm, I'm working under two masters right now. These dudes are sharing stuff that no other school is going to even offer. What kind of work were you doing for them? Um, I was mainly just like, you know, a, a painting assistant and, uh, you know, they, they took on like a slew of different types of painting gigs, man. Like that, that was, that's what I'm getting at. Like the range and versatility within them, within that job and what they offered it and what they presented as a company between the two of them was just incredible. Um, so you know, it, it, it spanned, you know, massive four story hand painted with brush paint, you know, uh, murals all the way down to more intricate stuff on canvas to oil painting on canvas to, you know, it was whatever, you know, they could line up that paid the bills like, but they were, you know, high end stuff, you know, from interior, you know, residential stuff to, you know, exterior, you know, commercial stuff. How long did you end up uh, working at Icon? Man, it, it was it was off and on, you know, like big stints, but at the same time, I think um, collectively about six total years. Um, okay. I mean, I picked up a lot of skills working with those guys, and and uh, you know, like a lot of stuff that's in my work now, like for sure, like unquestionable, like they, you know, like the wood layering stuff that I do, like I picked up a lot of those skills from those guys, like, um, you know, yeah. Very cool. Um, and, and while working at Icon, were you still able to create like your own personal work uh, uh, at the same time, like on the side? Yeah, you know, I I just went you know pretty much twenty four seven. You know, I w- was very thankful to work with them in that type of creative environment, and it really pushed um, my creative desires with my own work. So like there, I was you know working with them during the day, general nine to five type hours, and then. I'd be thinking about my stuff and I'd like ride my bike home, which was just, you know, literally two miles away and like, you know, start working on, on, on paintings and canvases and whatnot. Like, you know, in in my own little like bedroom studio and just keep pushing it, you know, like just pushing, pushing forward, even though there was like no hope for that. Like Instagram didn't really like exist. There was, there wasn't really anything going on with that shit, you know? So I was just like trying to do the, the the more standard traditional gallery style approach and nothing was biting, you know, you know, it was, it was rough, you know, like at first it was a little disheartening, of course, um, you know, and Dallas is a weird scene too. So like there I am trying to, you know, make the work that I, I believe is, you know, honest to me and, and what I enjoy and what I'd like to see as an artist and viewer of art and, and uh, you know, People were like stoked on it and with, sh- with the, you know, whenever I show them at, at exhibitions, but like nobody's buying them and, you know, not even really knowing how to kick that off or how to like validate the value of, of the, of the price I'm adding to these, you know, and, you know, not making a single commission, nothing, you know, but still pushing forward with the creative um, desires to, you know, make, make better work and just have, you know, keep moving forward with that motivation, you know, like working at Icon was just massively motivating because, you know, they were, they were doing it and they, you know, they made it happen, you know, and I didn't know at a certain point right before like my 
personal fine art career actually started to take hold and, and grab traction, you know, I was considering starting my own little like, you know, commercial uh, mural company or something, you know, because like work was kind of getting weird with them a little bit, like in terms of like, it wasn't as consistent, you know, there was like starting to find gaps and I'm like, you know, I can try to, you know, keep working with them and maybe I can figure out my own like little side murals or something, you know, that type of thing. But like literally whenever I was trying to figure that out, like, you know, my, my stuff jumped off. I started lining up some, some, uh, gallery shows via, uh, galleries that were finding my work on Instagram. So it just started to, to, you know, actually happen that way. It was wild. And, and was that was that in 2015? Because like yeah. according to your like your CV, it seemed like everything started it happening in 2015. Off, right? yeah. <laughs> it was I'd say like the very very beginning of 2015. Like um, I, you know, 2014 ish, 2013, 2014. I think I made a shift where my Instagram I deleted all the private, personal you know sort of photos of you know my dog and whatnot. You know. And, you know, visiting Catalina Island or whatever the crap that, you know, those were in like focused on like my, my paintings and, and what I was doing in my process and just tried to make it a feed about that. And, um, it's the smartest thing I've ever done because, you know, there was no serious algorithm in place there. Like I was, you know, actually legitimately getting my work in front of people and giving them the opportunity to see what I'm working on in my bedroom and, you know, and, and it just took off and then, you know, gallery shows started to kick off and um, had that big opportunity with Forest for the Trees Mural Festival um, to paint that big mural in Portland, which is like a six story building, like the upper four stories. So I, that was just incredible, like an opportunity like that. And like that mural is still riding to this day. Um, nice. And, it, it, you know, then I had like my first solo show, a small gallery. It's not even that doesn't even exist anymore in Denver and sold everything pretty much. And, you know, just, it was like, I went from like, how am I going to make, you know, bills, like as a, as a, as a full-time fine artist here, if I'm moving away from working with, you know, leaning on a company presenting the, the work to me, cause I've always been focused in the, in the art aspect of work, but, you know, never was I a full-time artist leaning solely on my own stuff. And so like that transition, you know, that leap of faith, never really occurred it would just it literally transitioned like, like overnight perfectly. it sounds like <laughs> yeah, yeah it was just like all of a sudden it was like I'm, I'm trying to hang on here um you know the demands were real there was commissions coming in and and uh just you know of course extremely thankful you know but trying to figure out how do i do this now now i'm you know needing to figure out how to be an artist like an actual full-time artist like you know spent my entire life learning how to make art but you know now here i am trying to figure out like how do how do you do this how do you balance this how do you how do you make art the the time you know, you, you figure out the the time requirements for each piece and and you know the money that's invested in these works and then you know what's the price tag where you, where can you sell the works like where do i start my 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 value off at you know like i want to sell them but i don't want to start too low but i don't want to start too high and you know yeah, it's like a whole new set of problems you inherited. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of problems. So like a, a year, like a year after that in 2016, um, you know, after you really kind of you found your footing in the gallery scene, um, you joined up with Red Bull Arts in, in Detroit right. um, for one of their artist residencies. Uh, and, and when I had Matt Eaton on a few episodes ago, you know, he and I talked about the role that, um, you know, Red Bull Arts has played in the art community and how they've helped to uplift artists, you know, that, that were just getting their start. Um, so it's really cool to see, you know, you actually on the other side of that. How did, how did you first connect with Matt and, and how did that residency come about? a hundred percent Instagram again, like he came across my work. Um, I was getting some pretty significant, you know, exposure, you know, a lot of shout outs, you know, like high fructose and juxtapose and stuff. So like, you know, I don't know exactly how he came across my work, but you know, he, he saw my feed and, and liked what I was doing and reached out to me direct message and was like, Hey, you know, really like your work, interested in it, you know? And I told him I had a, that, that show coming up, the one in Denver. And he was like, yeah, send me the, 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 the PDF of, of the works that'll be available. And so I did that, you know, I don't, he didn't, you know, buy anything, but, uh, um, he definitely was impressed with that body of work. And, uh, 
Um, then I didn't hear from him for a while. And again, like you said, like 2016 or so, like maybe February or yeah, I'd say February. Um, he direct messaged me again and he was like, Hey, I've got this opportunity. I wanted to present it to you. And he told me about the, the residency and, you know, it was paid. And I'm just like, he's like, think it over. And what I'm like, think it over, bro. Like, <laughs> you talking about paid time where, you know, like I was, like I was in that period where I was explaining, we're like trying to figure this out. Like I'm not, I'm trying to make paintings. I'm trying to be legit, but I'm over here trying to, you know, bring in money to where I can like, I, I feel like I can do this. I'm not having these massive gaps of income coming in. So I'm trying to figure out like, do I make t-shirts? Do I, you know, what, what do I do? And, uh, you know, all of a sudden this opportunity just comes in and, you know, in terms of my own like fine art career, like that opportunity was huge for me. Like after doing that and, you know, I sold everything in the exhibition that was a part of that, um, that residency. Um, and after that, I've, I've just been like literally like hanging on every year. It just exponentially boosts higher and higher. You know, it's just extremely incredible to, 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 you know, experience this, this, this ride and you know, very, 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 very thankful. You know, I just want to reiterate that because I, I know how tough it is. How did that residency end up working? Like, did you have a goal going into that where you wanted to build out a body of work for a show or what was the residency like? Well, the, First off, like I had some 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 concepts that I've been messing with, and within my own you know obvious practices um, via material combinations, and um, I was kind of struggling with it, um, and I wanted to you know see if I couldn't you know utilize that designated extensive amount of time to investigate and and, and push those those. Uh, experiments further and and i think i came out with some pretty cool pieces um one of which we just did a, a huge uh, lithograph reproduction of matter of fact matt eaton owns that painting nice. the guy's the man love that guy uh, were there other artists there with you um w- while you were doing it yeah uh ian kualii and uh drew Merritt. um so you know they we we all got along really well thankfully you know we heard some some horror stories for the residents, the residencies afterwards, Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, after, after hours, we heard some, there was some, some drama. So we were thankful that, you know, we all gelled pretty well. And, and I, you know, our, our exhibition, not that the exhibition was the focus. It was just kind of like something that we put together to display what we made, but like the curation, it really like showed off like how awesome Matt's eye was for the combination of the artists that he brought together. It is a really cool exhibition. One of my favorite shows I've ever been in, um, you know, and, and the reviews from, from fans alike, you know, some people saying that, you know, it's their favorite show that they've seen there to this day, you know, so that's huge to hear, man. Have you, have you stayed in touch with those guys uh, that you were working with? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Those are really good, good people. So after, you know, wrapping up your time there in Detroit, uh, is that when you ended up moving out to LA or was that later? Pretty much. Um, it, it was, um, a few months later, but, uh, it, you know, it all happened really quick. It pretty much, pretty much seamlessly. How have you liked, uh, living in LA? It's been great, man. Um, I really enjoy, you know, the people here and, you know, the, the weather of course is, is great. And, you know, I, I've been just hammered with work, so it's not like I've been going to the freaking beach. I've literally been to the beach once. I've been here for almost four years again oh, wow. or something. Yeah. And it's like, I, I don't do that stuff, man. I work all the time. So, you know, um, being in LA is great and like, I like it, but really I'm just a studio rat, bro. Like you can (laughs) implant me with a studio space in any state or city and I'm going to do my thing. So. Well, and then back to the idea that you were talking about earlier about affordability and, you know, building yourself to the point where you can buy a house and, you know, set your roots somewhere. Mm LA is expensive. So does that mean that you might not stay there or is that going to end up being the place you stay? Yeah, I, I'm definitely uh, uh, considering moving out of out of LA due to the the high rent. And you know, this past year, well, the past couple of years with the wildfires have have been pretty pretty serious. And um, the most recent year been extremely bad. Like you know, the wildfires extremely close to um, the city, and the air quality is just trash. And you know, like 
that's a hard thing to control. You know, we're, we're into a, you know, new, new territory with, you know, climate change and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's getting super hot here, dude. Like the, it's, it's not, so, it's Southern California. Yeah. It's not supposed to be in the hundreds. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So you think, uh, Dallas will be your in destination or are you thinking about other places? You know, like I said, I love New York. I, you know, I love all these. You know, I love. I really enjoyed Detroit whenever I I was there for three months. You know, I seriously considered that area. But you know, it would be good to be back close to my family. You know, my mom, and dad, my uh, my my brother, and his wife, and my two nieces. You know, so you know, we got a nice little mini family. You know, I'd like to not be so so far apart from them. And COVID really, you know, messed messed up. You know, traveling and visiting. So I haven't seen them in a solid year yeah. plus. Um, so, you know, getting over there and, and, and you know, the, the cost of living in Dallas is just, you know, there's there's no income tax. First off, let's start there, dude. Like <laughs> the amount of taxes I paid last year was just incredible. It was crazy. Like, like, holy shit. Like 2015, I didn't even make that money. <laughs> like <laughs> it's crazy. So like the, the, the taxes in California are crazy, dude. Like. Um, so, you know, Dallas would be a great place to potentially be able to have a house and be able to build a little studio on the same property and, 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 you know, be able to, you know, f fund my, my practice moving forward. You know, like I said, I can't expect people to be buying the paintings, my, my, my paintings at the same rate that they are. You know, I don't, I don't want to do that. You know, I, I think that that's, you know, being a little overly, uh, you know, hopeful with with sales man like i've been very very lucky you know like sold out many many shows and i can't just approach life like i'm always going to sell out a show like that's just not a reality in my my opinion so you know when, when does the hype wear off with you know michael reader's paintings you know i, I still want to be an artist i still want to be a full-time artist and you know i still want to be able to have a studio and make my work for the people that stick with me and hang with me moving forward and you know, uh, I can't, I don't see myself being able to do that, dropping like $1.5 million on a thousand square foot house in LA. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's just stupid. <laughs> well, and it's smart that you're thinking about that and, and really, you know, not letting it get to your head and really being humble about the whole thing and, and thinking about the long term rather than just the immediate, you know, push. <laughs> I yeah, guess. man. You know, it's, it's not the same for for every artist, of course. You know, some artists get out of school and they they have immediate success and that's all that they know. And more power to them, you know what I mean? And maybe they won't ever, you know, think like I do, you know, but like I, I fought really hard to, you know, many, many, you know, the better part of a decade after, after graduating college to, to try and, you know, figure this out and, and develop a demand and have people pay attention to what I'm doing. And, and, uh, you know, so I understand that it's all just existing on this paper thin foundation you know like i you know you can fall right through that at any moment any hiccup any anything you know so um just again and i'm not just trying to be corny i'm like extremely extremely thankful and you know I'm just i spend a crazy amount of time in the studio and like that's for the fans of my work you know i want to i want to keep making new stuff for them and make stuff available for the collectors that want to hang my stuff in their work in their home and um you know, like that, that's my motivation. Very cool. So let's, let's dive into your work a bit. Um, you know, and, and actually your really early work, the stuff that really came before you really broke out and onto the scene, um, was a lot different from what you make today, you know, with like little to no figures, more focusing on, on these buildings and sort of Escher-esque type structures. And it even had like a narrative slant to it. Um, like how did that evolution take place and, and what took you from what you were making back then to focusing more on the figure and, and the stuff that you make today? Well, you know, before that, the, you know, my, most of my work was, was actually pretty centered on the portrait and the face and everything. It's just something that I've always been into drawing and rendering and, you know, ever since I was a little kid. So whenever I got to, I, I want to say junior year, of of college um i i went full abstract like i didn't even it wasn't even any kind of like i studied abstract expressionism under a few like legitimate you know abstract expressionist painters you know you know michael goldberg um uh, a few a few others um that like legit just full-blown 
non-representational abstract painting. So like I learned that language. And then as I stepped into my senior year, I wanted to bring in representational elements because I enjoy painting that type of stuff. I, I, I like rendering things out. And, uh, you know, so inevitably the, the, the figure came back in and was reintroduced. And then one of, one of my instructors, Gary Simmons, he was like, Hey, you know, I got an interesting challenge for you. Why don't you, cause I would place the figures in, in an environment, but I of course inevitably was making a major focus on the figure. Then the environment was kind of, you know, secondary and it was very, very clear and apparent. Um, so he was like, why don't, why don't you create the environment that the the figure resides in and there's elements of of the existence of a figure but there is no you don't paint the figure so build these environments and leave them empty and you know so literally for the rest of the year like that's what I did like it was it was actually very refreshing you know and and fun um and that carried on after I graduated and, you know, I was introduced to potassium silicate paint with icon with one of the big jobs that we worked on. And they gave me like a, a range of paints, you know, as, as a gift. And cause it, it's extremely expensive and the quantities that you have to order are really large. So there was just no way I was ever going to be able to buy that stuff. So they hooked me up with the, a, a mini line of the palette. And so I made a series of paintings for a show and, you know, followed that same, path of you know of, of the structures and and the no figure but then I started to bring the, the figure in and so you know it's like it all went full circle and so now there was more of a a legitimate equal balance of focus on the 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 structures and the environment and the figure you know and then I started to realize that you know the these structures represent uh, the you know the the human vessel you know as as this you know thing that holds stuff you know and, and like I just went with that general concept for making decisions on the on the picture plane and um and you know keeping it abstract keep, keeping it you know representational you know just like really trying to you know bring in as many different things that I learned and again like we were discussing earlier you know like trying to weed through the stuff that I was told to do or suggested to and you know figure out what works for me and so like that early body of work is, is uh, representative of, of that journey of trying to hash out what I wanted in my work and what I don't want in my work. So then how did that end up changing, I guess, to what you're making today? Did you make like a, a conscious effort or was it more of an organic evolution where it sort of grew into what it became? Yeah, I hit like a pretty significant like roadblock, you know, like I was saying earlier, like, you know, people weren't like necessarily, you know, you know, jumping for joy with, with those works. And, you know, like I was just trying to stay open and, and not stay confined and, and hard headed and, and keep the potential open. So, you know, I, I just stopped and I was probably like six months or so. I didn't make a single painting or whatever. I was just working. And then I got fed up. I realized like, dude, like, you know, you're not happy, not painting, you know, you, that's what you do. You make stuff. So I just, decided to simplify everything and try to start over. And like I started with these really small panel, like single gesso panels, um, like maybe like nine by 14 inches or something, nine by 12 inches or something. And just started, you know, painting these portraits for no freaking reason other than to sit down after work and do that. And they were very stylized and illustration based. Um, and I'd say like the first six were like that. And then I moved from Long Beach to, to New York and started doing fine, you know, uh, art handling with like legit, you know, galleries and whatnot. So I started to see that higher end blue chip level of works, you know, not even just in the galleries, but like, you know, behind the scenes, like flipping the painting around, seeing the way it's built, like the internal structures, you know, like the way they, you know, just the whole world, I was re-immersed in it immediately. And, uh, so I was pushed to a more, you know, fine art kind of desire of, of making portraits. So like I was working a bunch of hours, dude, like doing that fine art stuff, or I'm sorry, the art handling stuff. And, um, and so like, you know, riding the train in New York over an hour both ways. And, you know, like there was, didn't leave much time for me to make paintings, but I was, I was adamant about trying to do it anyways. So I had to develop this method of, 
making art that like, you know, I could come home, shower, eat, and then get in the bedroom studio and mess with a couple surfaces for, you know, an hour and then do the same thing tomorrow and just build up these surfaces and then do like a hit with a portrait. And then like three days later, come in and respond to that and maybe have like six canvases going the same size with the same steps, different colors. And that's how I started to get back, get into the repetition nature of the portrait that you see in my work. Um, and I realized that I was able to focus more on the elements of, of the painting outside of the imagery, you know, a little bit more, um, like where the, the materials and the surface became more focused in the, the, as, as the content of the painting than just, you know, who am I going to paint this time? I need to get a, a photograph of this person's portrait with the right lighting. I want them to be turned this way. What are they going to be wearing? What are they going to be holding? I was just legit using a reference from a, 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 I think it was like a zine that I found and it was like a black and white photo of this dude and the, the lighting was very harsh and I just liked the shapes and I just ran with that and I just painted that over and over. I mean, over and over again for like years and it really opened the door for, like I was just saying, like, you know, focusing on like, what are, what are the elements that makes this person you know, exist on the, the picture plane. And then I realized that that correlates with our own identities in a way, you know, what, what makes us who we are? We're not, you know, if you and I stood next to each other, we'd look very similar because, you know, we're, we're male and, you know, might be similar height or whatever. We got two arms, but you know, our internal self in terms of our upbringing are very different. And, you know, that's what comprises, you know, our, our self. And, and so I, liked and enjoyed that correlation with the physical, tactile, you know, factual aspect of painting, like in abstract painting, like that's very real, you know, like you're moving paint around, like, you know, in a, you know, very physical way. You're not focusing on an, uh, you know, illusionary space or trying to, you know, fool the eye with like atmospheric space or like this landscape. You're just, push and paint around and color and space. So, you know, just meshing those two together um, is where, you know, the new work kind of like just started to take off. And like there was a lot of energy and, and, and power moving forward with that. And then being able to, you know, find, become comfortable in, in my, my newfound language, visual language, and then being able to bring in new stuff, and, and older tricks as well, you know, picked up with Icon and, and whatnot, and then being able to bring in the graffiti stuff. And, you know, then I just started to realize that I could, my style could be comprised of many of the things that I've learned, not just, you know, one thing that I honed in and became good at. Like, I was able to utilize 20 different things and make the portraits in my work that you see now. Well, and that's one thing that I really appreciate about you know, the way that you approach art making, and you've talked a lot about this just in general um, throughout our, our discussion, is, is that you're you're constantly experimenting and, and like pushing the boundaries of what a, a quote unquote painting even is. Um, and, and it's like you're, you know, breaking down these barriers between traditional painting and sculpture and graphic design and, and like blending all these different ways of creation into your work. So I guess where does that sense of experimentation and, and boundary pushing, if that's a word, uh, come from? Probably just from the, my, my interest in making things, you know, uh, since uh, early on, you know, I think it just hung with me. But I think at a certain point later in the game, like I've realized that um, I can, I can, I gain a lot of, uh, motivation and, and focus in my practice from the investigation of these different materials. Um, and I, I, you know, my, my process is quite open. You might not, you know, many people might look at my work and be like, man, that's pretty refined stuff. You know, like, you know, there's some pretty dialed areas in there, but what you're not realizing most part is, you know, it, you know, there was like a rough sketch to begin with, maybe an idea, maybe a general palette, you know, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of it's very open and, uh, you know, using new materials uh, presents these new ideas and, you know, uh, things that you stumble upon in the studio um, in real time and trying to remember 
those little things, like find ways to jot down that, that little uh, discovery so that you can pull that back up and, and later on and actually try to utilize it um, in a piece, you know, not just have a happy accident and then move on, like literally notice and figure out that that happy accident has potential beyond being an accident. Um, and, you know, messing with new materials, it presents that tenfold, you know, because you're not as comfortable with the material. It's brand new. It's doing things that you, you know, didn't foresee happening and you weren't prepared or like you put the wrong base down. And so now it's doing some weird cracking, but you're like, that's kind of cool, you know? So I, you know, that's a big part of what keeps me interested in my own work, man. You know, when you put in the hours that I do, it's, you know, I don't know how some of these artists do it, dude, like where they, they just sit down with their oil paint and they have like a, uh, an image that they, they drew up in Photoshop or something. And they're just freaking painting that for hours every day. Like, nah, <laughs> no way. That is not me, dude. Like I can't do that. Like, you know, hats off to them. You know, I'm glad that they do that. And that work exists. Like, you know, I enjoy it. I enjoy looking at it. I don't enjoy participating in making that stuff. Not to say that I can't do it, but, you know, I've gone down that path of learning how to, you know, render things to look, you know, as real as possible. And, um, you know, I, I just enjoy the more physical um, uh, aspect of, of the different materials and what it what it offers. And, and you do use a lot of different mediums um, from, you know, acrylic to spray paint to oil, enamel. Like, how do you go about deciding what medium is right for a particular piece? Man, I think it really just has to do with, you know, back to what I was kind of getting at. Like maybe I, I discovered like an idea where like, you know, I was working on a piece and building up the layers and then midway through these two colors set off just the right way. And, I'm you know, take a quick photo of it and try to remember and not lose that and, you know, use that as like a loose base to, you know, move forward in the, in the, in the next piece, you know, and, you know, having you know, utilizing the different materials, you know, each one has its own finish or its own surface or it, you know, offers its own sort of characteristics. So, you know, sitting those next to each other is, is a lot of fun and having them, you know, kind of feed off of each other and have a nice dialogue, not even just color wise, but surface wise and, uh, you know, finish sheen wise, you know, there's so many different elements when whenever you step into that world it's not just like you know okay i'm gonna varnish this whole painting and be done now of course i just did a show that everything was 2d super flat on canvas and paper but you know that i i I like the fact that i've i've built this you know process in my my practice to where i was able to be like hey let's switch it up and go back to flat canvas and like everybody's like whoa bro like what is this new stuff he's like (laughs) Why are you bugging out that I'm just painting flat whenever so many other people paint flat, you know, but, you know, it, it's kind of cool that that I've managed to you know, create that. Yeah, no, that's very cool. And, and one of the, the ones that's fascinated me the most is the, the work that you've made in concrete, which is is very uncommon from a medium perspective. Um, and I think it was a piece called False Guru that that's first kicked that off. Yeah. Where, where did the idea come from to use concrete? Uh, it, it initially kicked off, you know, man, like five years ago or something uh, with when I was trying to utilize that potassium silicate paint that I mentioned. That stuff is meant to be utilized on an open porous surface because it needs to absorb into a, that substrate. And so it's meant to go on concrete or plaster or brick or something like that. And, you know, concrete's just a rad material. And, you know, being, you know, urban focused in my work, you know, being able to bring in a material that's literally out and in in the street and bring it into my work was a goal of mine, but it's, it wasn't so quick, like, all right, I'm going to work with concrete and we're going to hang it on the wall and it's going to work. Like, man, I had so many failed attempts. Um, so many things ended up in the dumpster, um, for years. And, uh, it wasn't until I reached a point with my work where, I started doing the wood cutouts where like the background was the top layer. And so the face and the portrait started to recess in the layering. Um, And then I realized one day whenever I was kind of midway through again, being aware of the total process is massive for me. So, you know, I was like midway through one of the pieces with one of the head shapes cut out. And I was like, man, if I just 
build a pocket behind here that recesses and encloses this head shape that's negative, I could fill that with concrete with, you know, some sub, you know, some meshing and whatnot that would hold it in place and, uh, and then paint on top of that. And then that, that's literally what I did. I mean, I went about it. I've made some adjustments like false guru actually cracked dead in half, which from, you know, in the original, like it, uh, it, it's sold with the crack, you know, it's, it's just part of like the, the specific concrete that I used and, how thin it was and all that, you know, it's a cool crack, but when I mean, you're trying to not have your freaking painting crack, you know, it's <laughs> kind of like, Oh no. Um, but yeah, that, you know, that, that kicked it off. And, um, I really enjoy, you know, working that way. And I, and I look forward to, you know, doing it more for sure. Have you ever had any issues with like the weight of it? I mean, cause I, I always imagine concrete as being heavy and bulky and, and something you wouldn't imagine hanging on the wall, you know? <laughs> You know, weight is definitely a concern. I haven't done anything massive, you know, and the fact that, you know, I have to couple it with the wood, wood is not light. So a matter of fact, like, you know, doing like, you know, um, weight comparisons, some of my wood layered paintings, bro, like they, they can weigh 60 pounds oh, wow. um, and they need legitimate, you know, cleat hanging, you know, systems. So it really hasn't you know, it's not like I'm making a full panel out of concrete. Like that would be hundreds of pounds. Not to say that I won't eventually, but <laughs> <laughs> we're working on that. Um, but, um, um, you know, right now it's just pockets. So one of the one that had the most concrete was a 24 by 30 and it had a skull and a, and ha a hand and arm that were concrete. Um, and you know, that it wasn't that heavy, man. Like it wasn't like I had to do anything extra that I wasn't already having to do with the wood paintings. Okay. Really the biggest issue with the concrete is how brittle it is. It doesn't flex, it, you know, obviously it's just this chunk of hard concrete. Like you, it can't flex. There's no give. Like you got, you know, if somebody, you know, it's, it's a fine art piece. You're not supposed to be dropping it anyways, but you know, it's, I'm just saying, you know, like you pack it and you ship it and I'll send somebody, you know, pulls it out of the, the, the crate or something and there's like massive chunks of concrete that have sheeted off. That would be a bummer. And thankfully yeah. I haven't experienced that. Okay, that's good. Um, and, and so you mentioned earlier that, you know, you like your process being very organic and you, you like to be kind of in the moment as you're creating, um, you know, without a lot of upfront planning. Uh, how does that work with the multi-layered pieces where you have doors and hidden panels? I, mean, I have to imagine that there's a lot of planning that goes into that. So at what point does that come into play? Um, you know, honestly, like the ones with the doors, like all those, the, every one of the ones with the doors was brought in like midway through like mm. the building of it. You know, those, those works are generally built with, you know, the assemblage style with like the, the pattern blocks and the, you know, used, you know, excess pieces of wood in my studio from cutting all the different things, you know, and it takes a while to make those pieces because you have to accumulate enough of those types of things in the studio. It's not like I, I just have a ton of that stuff, you know, just like, you know, I got a huge bin in my studio full of these blocks I can use. Like, unfortunately I don't. So those works are kind of rare. There's maybe like four or five that have been made in that manner. Um, but uh, the most recent two, I did push forward a little bit harder with the door. The secret, all of them, for the most part, have had like a little quote unquote secret door um, where there's an image behind it. Where like these most recent ones, I, I was realizing that why don't I have the door open and it be a part of the the larger image, at, you know, as a whole. You know, like the portrait, you open the door and it's like a full face. You can see his face and you close it and it's like the more graphic pattern face. Um, so, it, you know, a lot of that stuff was, I came up with that idea in the middle of trying to find all those pieces and assemble the stuff. Like, again, like, you know, you go back to the fact that a lot of my work utilizes the same head shape. So I'm able to just jump in and be like, I'm going to make another head. He's going to be facing this way. Let's get that background piece cut, you know, and just get this process banging out like that. And not being so hung up on like, I, it needs to be this new image. It's like, well, what's going to be new is what makes up this character, this, this figure, this portrait, you know, the way I'm going to do it is going to be new and different. Like there's, you know, been a lot of shared imagery in my work, but man, like 
via the the complexities and the challenges that I've faced with myself, you know, that 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 I face in making these, I can tell you and attest to the fact that every one of these pieces are very, very different. Because I'm constantly like, how in the hell am I supposed to do this? You know, I want to do this, I want to do this, but like this, you know, it's like if I made if they were the same things, I would, it would just be a production line, just cranking them out, you know, yeah. and that, that's not the case. And with all the wood that you use, do you have like a lot of heavy like woodworking equipment there in your studio? I've got a, a bit of stuff, but honestly, I don't have that much space, you know, because um, I need space that's clean for the actual painting area, you know, like I can't just have like a massive wood shop, you know. So unfortunately, I, I you know, I don't have very much stuff. Um, a lot of the wood cutting happens outside. Thankfully, I have two big doors to my space, the ground level, so I can just open those doors and set up real quick with some sawhorses and keep the sawdust out of the studio because that's a problem. But, uh, you know, I've definitely been able to, you know, hone in on the material sourcing of, of the, of the wood too. Um, you know, back to the weight aspect, you know, um, I like to utilize a lot of, uh, MDF wood cause there's no grain. Um, so I'm not going to be battling any, potential splitting or I don't like seeing the grain in the, in the, the final finish. So it's, everything's super smooth cause it's a compressed fiber board. Um, but that stuff is extremely heavy, like a raw MDF, like a half inch or a three quarter inch. That's going to, you know, man, like 50, 60 pound sheet of four by eight, you know, that you're having to move around the studio by yourself. But I've managed to source that. I didn't even know. Thankfully a fellow artist told me about it, but they have actual, ultralight MDF. It's like, it's not as dense, but it is literally half the weight. So nice. I've been able to reduce as my paintings have gotten larger in scale and more layers, they've actually reduced in weight. Does your interest in, in woodworking and, and I guess your knowledge of the tools and the grains and all that, does that come from the, you said you were, you were doing carpentry work for a while early on in, in your career. Does that interest kind of come from that? There was a big part of it because that was while I was in school and um, the moment that I was introduced to all that stuff and those different techniques and whatnot, like almost immediately I started to bring those uh, those elements and, and techniques into my work in school. So I think it's a, a clear, direct influence for sure. But, you know, again, like I've, I've been messing around, you know, building stuff for as, as long as I can remember with the the most basic tools, you know, nailing a hammer, banging on stuff. Well, it's, it's amazing to me just kind of how every ask, you know, all these different things that, you know, are disparate components of the, you know, the work that you make today were all separately things that you had experience with earlier in your life. And you've sort of just been aware of your surroundings and bringing things in from the things that were around you. I, I really like right. that. Yeah. I mean, you know, that comes whenever I started to realize that myself and I started to more consciously focus on like, you know, you've done graphic design, you know, illustration, commercial murals, graffiti, you know, fine art studies with, you know, uh, abstract expressionism, you know, let's, let's try to find a way to bring that all together. And that really helped me hone in the, the underlying concept of my work with the, the, the identity aspect, you know, and how everything's comprised of this, you know, different levels of experience. And, uh, you know, I think it helped find that correlation from the literal image to the concept of why I'm doing it. But again, like, you know, I'm just building stuff. Like, you know, a lot of people need this, this meaning or this underlying theory, this storyline is, you know, I just, you know, why, why can't it just be about how I really enjoy making stuff with my hands? And I think it looks rad. Well, you do also incorporate themes of identity and stuff, which I think has been a constant underpinning to your work for, for several years, just the, the malleability, the layered nature of identity, um, mm -hmm. which, which can be a pretty heavy topic in and of itself. Have you ever studied like philosophy or any of those types of topics? I mean, not like intensely. I have, you know, a couple of courses in school, which probably was, you know, a, a reason for, you know, you know, the interest in it, of course, you know, but, you know, I'm not going to try and claim to be any major intellect in that, that field at all, man. I just, you know, I think in the general sense, it's, it's, in, it's interesting and, and, you know, something that every one of us can relate to. And so, you know, 
one of the big reasons why I think that I like making portraits is that, you know, people walk up to the painting and they can immediately relate to it because they're a person themselves, you know? So it's, you know, they can either, you know, view it as, you know, looking at a mirror or, you know, or at another person or whatever, you know, but regardless, you know, you're going to have an immediate reaction in response to the fact that it's a fellow portrait and the proportions generally are pretty life size. I, I, you know, I do scale up, of course, I've messed with that a few times where the proportions are massive, but for the most part, everything's quite lifelike in scale and that's on purpose. So let's talk a bit about your latest work, uh, Brick and Mortar, which debuted just a couple months ago in, in October right. uh, at Hashimoto there in San Francisco. Um, you know, and actually, you know, congratulations, that show, from what I understand, completely sold out even before it, it opened. So like, congrats on that. That's yeah. amazing. I mean, there wasn't a lot of pieces available. So, you know, that kind of helped out with that. But yeah, yeah, again, very thankful. And, you know, I didn't know, I was very skeptical of like the response to the work. I didn't know what was, how it was going to go or, you know, I was, I was really questioning it more so this time than, than other shows. Um, cause I, I do try to bring in a new element or some new aspect to my work for a show, you know, if, if it's theme related or not, you know, a new skull character that's completely graphic, that's never been seen before or something like that. Where like this, this show was more, it was definitely heavily themed. And like I mentioned earlier, all the works were flat and on canvas, no wood on paper. You know, some of them were just paper works, you know, behind a, a you know, frame and glass. And, you know, so I, I definitely felt a little vulnerable stepping into that realm. Um, I didn't want to upset too many of my fans, but at the same time, I, you know, not trying to concern myself with that because there will be wood layered pieces in the future. You know, I'm already working on them. So, you know, I just had to tell myself that. And even if the response wasn't phenomenal, like um, I just wanted to challenge, keep challenging myself and, and keep pushing myself outside of my comfort zone in the, that world of materials. Because, you know, we, we've discussed the different materials that I like to use and challenge myself with, you know, the, the investigation of these new materials and, you know, the more you do this stuff, the you know, the wood layered stuff, the more, you know, comfortable you become with it and it's there's a lot less to kind of stumble upon because you know your path from point a to point b is a little bit more straight and you know you're not stumbling onto as much stuff so i i i knew that it was time to pause with that and let it kind of just chill on the side and marinate and you know test test my uh my my rendering skills you know, outside of wood layering and, and whatnot and concrete and tar and all that stuff and just go acrylic on canvas and see how well I could, you know, create a, a successful painting and, and, and image. And it was a phenomenal challenge, bro. Like I thought, I thought that I was going to be able to shave off some time and be able to crank these out because I wouldn't have to cut wood and sand and prime. But really I realized that like the this wood layered aspect, you know, kind of presents some ability to keep things separate and make adjustments. And before you fully commit and bring it all together, where like in the, the painting on canvas, if I wasn't really vibing the way a brick wall was looking or the colors that it was built with or, or painted with, like I was going to have to freaking base that whole thing out in white and start over and not mess up the other stuff that was already painted. And like that was adding <clears throat> some time to the process. Like, it was, it was intense, man. So like now, now I'm stoked to get back to the freaking, the wood layering. <laughs> like, and it, and what, it's a quite a weird time um, to, to make new work. I mean, with the, the, yeah. the environment we're in, as far as, you know, COVID goes, did that, did that affect your ability to make the work for that show at all? It was definitely the main, you know, starting point for why I was working with paper initially. And, and, you know, eventually I just wanted to, you know, just absorb that, that path and utilize it as a, as a material theme, you know, like, yes, I, you know, like I was just explaining, I've been kind of wanting to do this, you know, and, and shift to flat 2d canvas and paperworks. But at the same time, when, when the lockdown went into place and didn't really have access to my studio the same way and, you know, materials like I normally would, cause the, the locations were closed down, like, you know, and early on, we didn't know what it was looking like. And I needed to figure out a path for my, my show and like what I was going to make. 
So I, 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 w- I just went ahead and removed, you know, the, the unknown of like, am I going to be able to gather all these materials? Am I going to be able to get to the studio and cut wood and spray paint and all this stuff? I was just like, what if I have to make this entire show in my, in my apartment, you know? And I ran with that. I wasn't going to let it hold me back, you know? And oddly enough, I started off very small, two eight by 10 inch paintings. And those are like the most liked uh, pieces that I've posted on my Instagram ever. And so I was like, this is a good sign. I'm going to run with this, <laughs> you know? So, you know, uh, just you know, I went up from that to, you know, 22 by 30 inch uh, works on paper. And then I had, um, you know, definitely the nicest uh, canvas wrap panels that I've ever had made, like pre-made for me by uh, Lucian, uh, what was the name of it? Lucian something. God, I can't remember. But anyways, it, quality shit, dude. Like very excited. There wasn't any issues of racking or, you know, one corner's hanging off the the side or it's not fully square. Like it was, it was a great thing. Even though it was a little pricey on the front end, it was a great, great, you know, way to kind of ease my mind with that. Cause I've definitely battled with that in the past. Very nice. Um, I guess, how did you arrive at the, the brick thematic? Cause that's, that's pretty much throughout the entire show. Um, most, right. all, almost all of the, the pieces have that sort of theme integrated. Um, you know, it, whenever I shifted to the 22 by thirties, I started trying to do some sketches because I was trying to because I wasn't going to be able to lean on the materials in the same way, there had it had to be a lot more sketching involved because I needed, you know, to focus on the imagery, and that opened the door for implementing, you know, new stuff, trying some new things out, and I wanted to replace the patterning that's really common in my work, um, just you know, as something new, see if I could, and in one of the images, um, you know, stumbled onto a brick wall pattern, and then it pushed forward and I really realized that, man, that could, you know, almost immediately I was like, that could really represent a lot of what we're dealing with right now in terms of boundaries, forced isolation and the whole thing, you know, these like heavy man-made walls and trying to, you know, you stuck on one side and, you know, longing to get to the other side, et cetera. Um, so that opened the door for imagery. So it was like that one little thing, like just, kicked off inspiration for every single one of the pieces that were made afterwards. Um, and I, I, I want to keep it, um, kind of isolated to that show, you know, sure. um, due to the isolation nature, you know, of COVID and the situation that, you know, surrounded the whole thing. So I'm going to try to fight to not keep using that, the element, you know, uh, kind of like this one little mini period of time is pretty significant for people. And maybe collectors would really, you know, appreciate and, and understand the significance of that body of work. Having worked in canvas before and then kind of moving more into wood and other types of mediums and then coming back to canvas, um, did you find yourself approaching the canvas work differently than you had in the past, like incorporating things that you had learned uh, in the in-between period? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the tricky part is I wanted to s- still maintain some level of, of surface that's common in in my other works, you know, which is easier to, to kind of build up with the wood and utilizing, you know, a paint roller and spray paint and all these different types of materials. So, um, I needed to kind of texturize the surface initially. Um, so that was definitely kind of a new thing, um, where it was like a preemptive thing where like usually the surface is kind of develops on its own um, throughout the process of building the painting. Um, so this time I kind of needed to build that, that, that texture because of the technique that I was hoping to utilize in, in terms of painting, you know, which is more of a, a, a dry brush technique where I'm layering color and you're utilizing some of the color coming through and you got this speckled look. Um, I really wanted to utilize that technique. Um, and so, yeah, definitely approached it in an entirely different manner. And I no no masking, nothing, you know, usually in, in my process, there's a lot of hand cut masking and spray paint stuff and, you know, hand painted, like a slew of different things where like this really got reduced down, hand painted, no masking, every line is hand pulled, every edge is hand pulled. Um, so it, 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 you know, that was another thing. It was a little personal thing where I was just like, no masking. We're not doing that. Even though I could have, 
because they were they were backed by a panel. They were rigid. I could have masked, no problem. Sure. No, I think that's cool. I think that that's that's nice how you kind of set your own constraints so that you can challenge yourself to work within those boundaries. I think it's important. Yeah. Yeah. And you were actually able to make it up to San Francisco for the opening. Um, you know, what was that like? I'm sure that was a bit surreal, just um, you know, opening a gallery like that. Dude, like so weird, man. Um, but, you know, I always talk about how like a lot of the exhibitions we we spend so much time in the studio, and you're so isolated from the rest of the world. You don't you're missing art shows you'd like to go to because you just got this massive deadline. There's no way you're gonna meet it unless you put the hours in. And then all of a sudden the show's done, the show's up, and then you're thrust into this massive opening with all these people and like you're losing your voice, trying to talk to everybody. You know, it's just, it's an intense thing. And um, that didn't happen this time. It was like, you know, we, you know, drive the works up and uh, have a show. And, you know, it, it was just small space. So when this show was locked in, I was like, man, I'm going to pack the shit out of that little space. You know what I mean? Like based off of my think space show in 2019, dude, like there are people lined around the block, you know? Yeah. So like, you know, that place was packed and it's like three times, four times the size of Hashimoto contemporary. And so I was like, man, this thing's going to be freaking jam packed. Um, and that didn't happen, you know, and you know, coming from LA and driving up to San Francisco, the stark difference of the way that the general population there is, is treating the COVID threat is uh, very, very real and apparent and clear. Um, it looked like a ghost town, dude. Like, I mean, there were people around, but everybody's wearing masks. There's not a single person not wearing a mask. Downtown Oakland looked like just boarded up. <laughs> it was wild, dude. Um, but, you know, I, I can appreciate it for sure. Yeah, no, that's interesting. The the dynamic between the two cities, even even within the boundaries of California, I wasn't expecting it, and that's why I brought it up. It was kind of shocking, but yeah, you know. Furthermore, the you know having the the, the general theme of my my show being focused on isolation and forced separation, you know, et cetera, and then having a show that people can only view through the freaking window was just it was weird. Is is really? Weird. I mean, eventually, I think the last week they were able to take appointment and uh, get some people in there to see stuff in person. Just, you know, it's just weird, man. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like a big fan of making work that the public can't have an opportunity to see. Um, like, it's probably my biggest, you know, issue with private commissions because usually they just get shipped straight to the the private. A collector and hangs on their wall and they, people just see a photo of it. Um, well, and that kind of ties back to your experience with graffiti. I mean, your love of graffiti was always that it was always in your face yeah, and you can't yeah. ignore it, you know? Yeah. You know, and the same reason why I participate with, you know, public, you know, murals and, and street art and stuff, you know? So, you know, I, I really like being able to make things that people enjoy and have an opportunity to, to witness in person and, you know, have a show in Japan, it, you know, you know, was a super, amazing opportunity that almost didn't happen because of the COVID thing, of course, you know, that timed out horribly. Yeah. That, that was a, uh, what Takashi Murakami space, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, Hidari Zingaro. Um, and you know, like, I, I lucked out though, you know, from what I understand, a lot of the shows that they had, um, scheduled got full on canceled cause they just couldn't find a slot. Maybe they'll do it later on next year or something, but, um, I lucked out because even though my show was postponed, my entire body of work was shipped to Japan. So it was sitting in Tokyo and they had that. So, you know, they were more willing to try and find a place to fit that in. So we were able to make it happen in the summertime, which again, just very stoked on that. Cause you know, being able to have people in an entirely different region of the world, see my work in person is very important via the, the different, aspects of my work the characteristics of it you know you see these like flat straight frontal photographs of on instagram they don't do my work any justice they don't do the color any justice nothing like my work gets hammered dude like the people that have not seen my work in person have not seen my work like they've seen a photograph of it you know i i get contacted from collectors that have purchased my work and they finally seeing a piece in person um, for the first time and, and like every time their, their response nearly every time is like, dude, photos do your work zero justice. 
And like, I mean, I geek out on the color, man. Like I love yeah. color. I love color relationships. I love color theory. I love surface. I love all those things. And they're all very much uh, a major part of my work and a flat photograph that a camera can only process a certain amount of is, you know, not very, very good. Yeah. And I'm sure that's, you know, the, the state of the world as we're in today, you know, I, I wonder how much that's going to affect the enjoyment people are able to take out of, out of what you're doing, you know? Yeah. So with, moving with, forward, even next year, like what, yeah. what is 2021 or yeah, 2021 look like? I don't know. I don't yeah. have any shows lined out for, for it. So, you know, with that, that was actually a good segue because that was what I was going to go to next. Um, you know, with that body of work out of the way, um, what do you have coming up next? Anything that you can share? Yeah, I mean, ma- mainly I'm just going to be working on on uh, private commissions, which is fun, a, a, a nice shift and be able to get some of those paintings to those folks that have been waiting, some of them a few years. So, you know, I, I'm excited to be able to lift that weight off of my shoulders um, you know, uh, and I do apologize for any of the collectors listening. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for your patience. Nah, uh, but in, in addition to that, um, I'm going to be participating with complex land, which is complex cons, uh, virtual sort of substitution this, uh, December. Um, usually, you know, that's one of the cons, um, you know, the convention, you know, uh, events and, uh, it's going to be pretty cool. I saw, you know, like a, a breakdown of, you know, what they presented to me in, in terms of the virtual world that people are going to be able to walk around in online. And it's pretty rad. Um, nice. So I'm going to have, you know, one or two things available for purchase um, on there. So that'll be, I believe, the very first week of December. Um, and uh, so I, I've, I've got a T-shirt that I just kicked off, have, you know, put the deposit down. Man, that stuff's so expensive to freaking have made, dude. Like, it is crazy. Like I would love to be able to offer all the sizes for all the people, but man, I just put down thousands of dollars like to have like a t-shirt produced. And, you know, obviously I'll make that money back, but it's like, dude, like it's out of the bank account right now. Right. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> it's like six G's man. Like that's geez. crazy. How, any new, uh, like prints coming up or, you know, that's um, on people's radar. Well, no, no prints. I just dropped two prints with the exhibition, you know, uh, that I had with Hashimoto and that went really well. Um, so no prints until next year, but you know, that's already in the works, a a really rad screen print. That'll be the, you know, very beginning of next year. Um, so really hyped on that. It's a great image. Um, uh, but in addition to that, working on again, the very, very beginning of the process of this, which is, um, um, a, a new sculpture, uh, like a one foot tall, you know, hoping to do a, a, a resin, um, nice. you know, edition, but definitely doing a, a bronze edition. So really, really excited about that. I'm really stoked on that. Awesome. You know, it'll have, it'll have all of the different patinas on it and stuff. Um, oh, that sounds but, amazing. But, yeah. We just got the 3d rendering fully approved by the, uh, the foundry and all that stuff. So really excited to be, be able to offer that. So it'll be, you know, one foot tall, but really heavy. Is there a timeline uh, set for that? Or do you have an ETA? Really or? hoping to have, you know, if, if everything goes as, as planned, it kind of got dragged out. Um, but we're hoping to have it available for purchase in, in December, um, at least pre-order. Nice. Um, Very cool. Well, um, where can people find you online to, to keep up with this stuff? Well, um, you can sign up for my newsletter. I'm not very good at it, but you know, I'm, I'm hoping to get you know do better with it. Um, um, it's on my, my newsletter on my, my website, michael-reader.com. Um, but really, the best way is on uh, Instagram at reader one o n e, and uh, yeah, that's usually that's that's my main thing. You know, Facebook is trashed. You <laughs> yeah. know, rough, rough yeah, no, place. It's- No good. Um, So last question, and and this is something that I like to ask everybody. Uh, Who is one artist that you'd like to see me have on the show? Um, Have have you had Balder Helgeson on here yet? No, no, I haven't. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of his work. Um, You know, he does portraiture stuff too, very characterized, really funny stuff. Um, Great, great painter for sure. Uh, 
I think he's like Icelandic or something, if I remember correctly. And he's in Chicago. So I'm sure he's got a freaking crazy story, probably much more interesting than mine. But uh, he's killing it, though, man. He's I really like his work. And, you know, it's been great to to follow his his boom. Um, you know, I was following his work for quite some time. And then all of a sudden, it really seemed like overnight, like big collectors were just eating it alive. So that was really rad to see. Awesome. Very cool. Well, well, thank you so much for doing the show, man. I really appreciate it. This has been a, a treat. Man, thank you, dude. I appreciate it. Yeah. Stoked to be on here, man. Thanks for uh, having me. So that's it for this episode of Art Affairs. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Michael. I thought it was so interesting how Michael's style has sort of organically become this combination of so many different kinds of art making, all brought together, blended in a very cohesive way. From the more illustrative and narrative-based college work that he did, to his experience at Icon, learning more about materials, to his experience with woodworking. And, and all that actually feeds right into the themes of identity and how layered and complex each person's identity is. Uh, you know, pulling from so many different aspects of your life. It's really cool stuff. Also, I'm excited about the new stuff he has coming up. It seems he has a lot of irons in the fire. Um, you know, he has new work coming out in a couple weeks at Complex Land in early December. He's going to have a new sculpture queued up for pre-order. It sounds like there's going to be a bronze edition, a resin edition, um, you know, as well as a new screen print early next year. Uh, and that bronze sculpture in particular sounds pretty killer. Uh, you know, definitely watch Michael's Instagram to get the latest on all these new works. So thanks again to Michael for joining me today. And thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. One big way you could help out if you're enjoying the show would be to review it on Apple Podcasts. And of course, just, you know, sharing it with your friends. As always, you can contact me through my website at artaffairspodcast.com or on Instagram at artaffairspodcast. So until next time, be good to yourself and be good to each other.